Here's what we're going to do. This is going to be um, very interactive. There's humor. There's humor. Um, there is uh, fun, and the process of learning will we'll have every one of you participating. I learn from you, because every time I do this lecture or any other lecture, there are always questions that come about that let me think a little bit differently. And uh, again, if you have questions, feel free to, um, to ask. So here's the story. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about um, uh, quotes in medical charts. We all know as physicians that 3 o'clock in the morning, um, sometimes our notes are not as clear as they need to be, correct? Uh, we're tired. Uh, they come out a little bit funny. So here's uh, a few quotes from medical charts. It starts out with this. The patient has been depressed ever since she began seeing me in 1983. Then it goes to this. The patient is tearful and crying constantly. She also appears to be depressed. Patient status, alive but without my permission. OK, starting to wake up. We're going to get you waking up completely here. The patient refused an autopsy. OK, you're starting to listen. OK, good. Um, the patient has no past history of suicides. Patient left the white blood cells at the other hospital. It goes on. Uh, the patient had waffles for breakfast and anorexia for lunch. <laughs> Last but not least, I'm going to do this very slowly so nobody gets the wrong idea. The patient has no rigors or shaking chills, but her husband states she was very hot in bed last night. <laughs> OK, I don't know what you guys are thinking about. I was thinking about something completely differently. Um, anyway, so this is interactive. We're going to be talking about uh, celiac disease or something else. Let's start out with this. How many of you have had a patient coming into your office, and I need to see a show of hands, a uh, patient coming into the office saying, I read on the internet, gluten is bad for me. I started a gluten-free diet. Tell me whether I have celiac disease, right? What do you do for these folks? Tell me. Eat gluten. Eat gluten. OK, so um, they've already stopped the gluten, so you already get the first prize. So why do you say eat gluten? Because when you, the antibodies go away when you stop gluten. OK, the antibody. OK, so that's one way. So what else do you do for these people? Is there something special that you can do for them? Go ahead. Tell me. Um, can we, um, we can challenge them. We can take the gluten away. And then has anybody ever done any genetic testing? Genetic testing. So we'll learn about that. So let's get started. Um, learning objectives to learn about the varied clinical manifestations of celiac disease, which is also called SPRU. Understand the workup of celiac disease, especially when the patient is already on a gluten-free diet. How many of you have had uh, patients uh, telling you they have non-celiac gluten sensitivity? Let me see those hands. It re it's, a real, it's a real entity, and I want to tell you about it. Uh, it is a true entity, um, and we're going to learn a lot more about that here today. Um, but uh, it exists, and why you're laughing is because you're thinking about all of those people who say they have non-celiac gluten sensitivity, who really have irritable bowel disease, right? You're shaking your head. And um, that's exactly um, part, of that, part of that difficulty. So um, number four is to learn how the symptoms of celiac disease, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, and irritable bowel syndrome can be identical. So what's gluten? And gluten is a protein in wheat, barley, and rye. Remember this, because you'll be uh, asked about this a little bit later. Uh, that gives elasticity to dough. Um, any of you have ever eaten uh, gluten-free bread? How does that taste? Terrible. terrible. It tastes terrible. But again, it varies from bakery to bakery. Being in New York, you get rewarded for that. Um, being in New York, um, um, I wanted to tell you about a little, a little story. I, I do lecturing around the country and around the world. Um, I gave a lecture, uh, this lecture, uh, in upstate New York. Anybody from Watertown or upstate New York? Okay, so how many people live in Watertown, New York? 
Right, nobody, well, about 10,000, eight, eight to 10,000 people. It makes my town of Manchester, Connecticut look like New York City. Uh, anyway, in that town, there were two restaurants, both of which have had extensive gluten-free menus, okay? So the bottom line here, when we're talking about a gluten-free diet, yes, in certain parts of the country where there are limited bakeries, um, yes, it can be terrible, but it really depends upon the bakery itself because there can be better quality uh, processing of the, uh, of the wheat to take out the gluten. So the bottom line here is let's move on to this. So what's celiac disease? For those of you who understand Spanish, um, you see um, uh, the difference between the left and the right. So who can describe what's the difference between the left and the right? What's that? The villi, loss of the villi. That's exactly right. So. Uh, loss of the villi, and that's part of that reaction uh, that we see when um, patients are exposed uh, to gluten. So what's the differential? Look at all this stuff. Uh, isn't this part of that uh, process that we think about uh, when the people come into the office and are thinking about um, all of these nonspecific abdominal pains, lactose intolerance, irritable bowel, inflammatory bowel disease, Medication, small bowel overgrowth, and infections, that's all part of that process that we think about as they come into the office. So non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So part of my message today is to tell you that it is a real entity. In years to come, we will have a marker for non-celiac gluten sensitivity. But again, who truly has this, who not, we will figure that out over time. But the definition here, as you can see, it's a variety of poorly understood reactions to gluten in a patient who do not have a diagnosis of SPRU. Let me tell you this story, and this will clarify it for you. My partner, who is an excellent gastroenterologist, had seen one of our best friends. I will not see friends as, as patients, as many of you um, can totally understand and had evaluated this uh, particular uh, lady for uh, abdominal pain, bloating, uh, discomfort. Uh, she was over uh, 50 at that time, and had had a massive workup. The massive workup had included endoscopy, colonoscopy, um, TTG. Can anybody tell me what TTG is? And what's it good for? It's ruling out celiac disease. I'll give you your reward later, okay? Um, anyway, um, so that's, ex that's exactly right. Had had the TTG, had had um, wh who knows what workup, and still was having the symptoms after my uh, partner had told her that she does not have celiac disease um, and was, was not sure what the next step would be read on the internet about non-celiac gluten sensitivity, started herself on a gluten-free diet, and has felt well ever since. When she restarts the gluten, she has all kinds of difficulties. Uh, when she stays away from the gluten, um, she feels perfectly fine. So it is a true entity, uh, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Here's the magnitude of the problem. Look at this, look at these figures. Um, the figures are that there are three million people in the United States um, who have celiac disease, but only 300,000 have been diagnosed. That's an amazing figure. Uh, we've gotta work with that a little bit more and try to uncover who truly has uh, the uh, celiac disease. And part of, that, part of the thing and the message of today is to try to uncover those people who you think might have um, irritable bowel, and maybe, maybe we can better define them as either celiac disease or non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Later on today, we're gonna be talking about uh, irritable bowel. We'll have a, a further discussion about that. But part of the thing that I wanted to, to uh, inform you about today, maybe we can do a little bit better with these people. Millions of people, obviously by the story that I said before, are following, you didn't get your reward. Um, millions of people are following um, the, um, uh, the uh, gluten-free diet who have non-celiac gluten sensitivity and um, let us go from there. Five-fold increase in prevalence of celiac disease in the past 50 years. Any nurse practitioners in the audience? Wonderful. 
I'm going to look you right in the face, and I want to thank you and your colleagues, because when I did this conference to a group of nurse practitioners, a whole bunch of them came to me afterwards and said, Dr. Buck, do you think that it's the genetically modified wheat that may be causing this problem? We've talked about that before. Dr. Rosen was just talking about you know, this, this toxic environment that we live in. So um, your, your colleagues told me, well, do you think it's the uh, genetically modified food? We don't know yet. We don't know yet. Uh, we may know in the future, but it certainly correlates with you know, the, uh, the amount of uh, GMOs that are out there. So uh, my neighbor had this uh, consumer's report hanging in his doorstep. I just happened to walk by um, uh, a few years ago and looked at it on his doorstep, borrowed it for a few days. I hope he, does, he doesn't mind because I really did put it back there because I want to show it to you. Um, the, fa the facts and figures are 25% of the general public believe they should be in a gluten-free diet. Since 2012, number of gluten-free products has grown 63%. It's unbelievable. Any part of the country, when you go to the supermarket, you'll be seeing the organics, and in part of the organics, you'll be seeing a gluten-free section. So you know that it's really picking up. But here is the issue. When it's gluten-free, um, the diets may include fats and sugars much higher than they would ordinarily to kind of give it flavor. So that's what we're faced with. This is the ultimate thing. Look at this. Gilda the gluten-free mouse. So moving on from there, we know what that diet can look like. And um, you can certainly look on my uh, handout, and you can look on the internet a little bit further. And um, most people in the United States with SPRU are, so this is going to be one of these interactive questions. And I push the button to get to the next point. Is that how we work it? No, you can just wait for answers. Okay, so go ahead. All right, it's varying, it's varying, it's varying, it's varying, varying. Look at this, it's con constantly moving. Wow. <laughs> Ooh. All right. It's like, a, it's like breathing pattern there. My goodness. Um, OK, still moving on the underway. OK, so um, here's the answer. Um, most people in the United States are overweight. Most people with SPRU or celiac disease are overweight. The paradigm has changed. You thought I'm not coming to this side of the room. Um, the paradigm has changed significantly. Um, when I was a young pup in gastroenterology, we had originally seen these kind of uh, people who have uh, SPRU. They were cachectic. They were super sick. Um, they looked like they were either Auschwitz victims. Got you smiling? They were either Auschwitz victims or cancer patients that we hadn't detected yet. The paradigm has changed. Most people in the United States these days are overweight. So we have to look at the kind of patients that, nice to see you, good morning. Um, most people in the United States are overweight and most people um, who have uh, potential for um, SPRU are overweight. So all of the following contain gluten except, let's do it. This is another learning one. And I just, did, I just did something similar with um, medical students the other day. Um, and I'm going to tell you what, uh, what they had said. OK. It's still moving. It's still moving. It's still moving. OK. Close. Um, so all of the following contain gluten except oats. So the answer is not dextrin. Dextrin contains gluten. It's one of these products that is in um, just about everything that we eat. Read the labels, has dextrin, um, artificial ingredients, and dextrin, um, but it's oats. Anybody can tell me, that anybody have any difficulty with oats as being part of a gluten-free diet? Can anybody tell me what that might be? <coughs> oats. Oats. Now, we know oats are, are generally 
gluten-free, but I want to reemphasize um, uh, to you why it may be a problem. And I'll tell you what I uh, heard from my medical students on, on Wednesday. Oats can be processed in the plant that also processes wheat. You can have a problem. So you have to read the labels and uh, be especially careful. If you're in a health food store, you'll generally do better. But if you have a patient who is extremely sensitive to um, uh, gluten, uh, you can sometimes get into trouble even with oats if they've been processed in the same pl plant that processes wheat. So we're learning, right? Which of the following is not a manifestation of sprue? We're doing pretty well with this. But there's also learning to be happening. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about that. Most of you got that right. Fever is not a manifestation of uh, sprue. And um, obstetrical problems can be. Obstetrical problems can be part of that uh, process. So we have to be uh, aware. It can be um, particularly low birth weight uh, kids. <clears throat> Neuropsychiatric um, uh, issues uh, can absolutely be part of that. That's one of the things. I saw you smiling from the other side of the room, so here's your reward. Yeah, thank you. Um, like thank you. Um, so uh, neuropsychiatric issues. Um, I had a presentation uh, that I just did two weeks ago. There was a psychiatrist sitting in the front of the uh, room who said that when she has her inpatient psych admissions and they're having GI issues, a little bit of diarrhea, bloating, weight loss, et cetera, all of those patients get their TTGs. All of their patients get TTGs because if we can turn this around with just a diagnosis of sprue, that's going to be almost miraculous for some of these people. Autoimmune disease, that's part and parcel of some of these folks uh, with uh, sprue because to a, certain, uh, to a certain degree, it is an autoimmune disease. And I'm going to tell you now a story of um, elevated transaminases. May all your patients listen to what you tell them. Um, elevated transaminases. Here's the story, and you'll remember the story as well. Listen carefully. Um, it is a patient referred to a gastroenterologist, nowhere's in New York and nowhere's in Connecticut, another part of the country, who was referred to the gastroenterologist for elevated liver function tests. And we know um, in working up elevated liver function tests, we have to check a bunch of things. Hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, um, autoimmune processes, primary biliary resources. You, you're already shaking your head. You know how big that list is, right? So uh, the list can be uh, pretty enormous. And uh, when that list is uh, pretty enormous, um, there's lots of testing to be done. That patient not only got um, all of that testing done, but also got a liver biopsy. Liver biopsy was accomplished, nonspecific findings. And with those nonspecific findings, um, the, and because of your smile, you have to be rewarded for that smile. Think about Hawaii. Um, so because of those nonspecific findings, was dumped back in the, in the lap of the primary care doctor. The primary care doctor, being a wise person, and now you'll all be aware of this, thought about um, non the patient also had nonspecific bloating, diarrhea, et cetera, did a TTG, IgA, as we just heard about before, positive, treated it, liver function test came down. Now you know. That's part of that differential, uh, part, of, uh, part of that situation. So just be aware um, that it can be part of that uh, process. And you may be saving a patient a huge workup and potential um, uh, complications. Liver biopsies are not necessarily benign things. So what's this? Dermatitis herpetiformis. And um, so how, can you describe it, exactly what it is? Dermatitis, it looks like herpes. It looks like herpes. So it's a, it's a bubble, you know, it's a bubbly kind of surface. And it's associated with celiac disease. In fact, um, when we have this kind of thing going on, um, if we uh, see this kind of thing going on, um, we probably just need to do a TTG, um, IgA, and we probably don't need to go any further. And it's not a dermatitis, dermatitis distribution. 
It is not dermatome distribution. You're wonderful. Great. You want a GI fellowship at UConn? Yeah. OK. Talk to me afterwards. Anyway, because you said this so very well, I want you to say to the audience um, very loudly what the button says um, and uh, share that with everybody. Nice and loud. I am an arrogant smart. No, it says, if I eat gluten, I'm completely sprued. If I eat gluten, I'm completely sprued. <laughs> Dermatitis hepatiformis. So thank you very much. Um, very itchy. It's a blistery kind of process. And again, I chose this picture because it was, it was a very dramatic picture. Um, you don't usually see it as dramatic. But it's mostly, as you can see, located in the forearms, elbows, uh, knees, buttocks. 10% of patients with celiac disease and oftentimes without GI symptoms. So uh, again, I want to reemphasize what I said before. When we have this kind of uh, situation going on, you don't need to do a massive workup. Uh, the blood test is uh, uh, sufficient in 99.9% .9 of the times. So here are some non-GI uh, non, uh, uh, manifestations of uh, SPRU that we need to know about. Um, and uh, we have to think about as well because, uh, again, the, top, the title of this, it's, it's a great pretender. It could be so many other things. So the osteopenia. The delayed puberty, short stature, um, tooth discoloration, aphthous ulcers can all be part of this, um, this process as well. What's the best serum test to evaluate SPRU? We heard it several times today. All right, everybody got it. Perfect. What percentage of celiac patients are IgA deficient? So while you're thinking about that, let me also uh, put in um, let me also put in this. Why why I said that um, is that people oftentimes ask me, well, should I do the big panel? You know, which costs probably several hundred dollars. Should I just do um, <coughs> IgA? Um, I uh, the TTG IgA. Should I do TTG IgG? Uh, anti-endomycel, which is another alternative um, uh, test. Um, and again, I'm going to help you with that because I learned something just a few weeks ago um, that I want to share with you. The answer to this is it's 2 to 5. It's not that high. It's not the 10 to 15. It's 2 to 5 um, who are IgA deficient. So who can tell me, for a special prize here, of what uh, is the clinical manifestation of IgA deficiency. What do we find when we have IgA deficiency? Yeah, you can have respiratory. Okay. So there can be respiratory. There can be multiple infections and things, things along those lines. Um, but again, that's the minority. I used to think the exact same way. It's not the majority of patients. It's the minority of patients. It's like 25%, 30% of those patients. So uh, just to be aware, so IgA <coughs> deficiency can sometimes be um, uh, underdiagnosed because it's um, not necessarily going to present with symptoms. So now it's your opportunity to tell everybody what this button says. So go ahead. Nice and loud. Unfortunately, Code Brown has nothing to do with chocolate. Unfortunately, Code Brown has nothing to do with chocolate. Another GI. Aha, we meet again. OK, here's the um, meat of the issue of what we're going to be talking about today. Because Sarah is that typical kind of patient. And she looks a little bit angry. Um, and she has an attitude. Um, you can already see, you know what kind of patient we're talking about. You already know. You've seen that kind of patient before. And you know you've got to really suck it in. Um, here's, here's your smiley button. Uh, you got to suck it in because, um, you know, she's pissed off to start out with. And if you don't give the right answer and you're not cost effective, um, you know, she's going to let you have it. And um, so Sarah is a 43-year-old female with a lifelong history of diarrhea and abdominal pain. She started on a strict gluten-free diet eight weeks ago based on information she read on the Internet. Sounds familiar. She now feels 50% better and asks you to make a definitive diagnosis. So um, that's going to be part of what we need to do. So 
what do we tell Sarah? We, we heard a little bit before about um, she can continue to stay on that diet. We can challenge her uh, with, a, um, with uh, some gluten. Um, but let me ask you this. Let me come up here. How many of you, um, when we have these kind of patients who are uh, looking at micrograms, not even milligrams, micrograms of gluten in their diet are happy to make a change and start a gluten challenge? So tell me. Are they, hap are they happy to restart that diet? Right, because some of them will even say, well, I get anaphylactic reactions. I don't want to end up in the emergency room, and certainly I don't want to sue you, doctor. You know, they'll tell you stuff like that. They're, they just, you know, have, this, have these perceptions. And you know what I'm talking about, because sometimes these people are extremely tough to deal with. So, so here, here are the three choices. So um, we talked about um, two and three, but let me tell you about one, because it, I really want to teach you about one. It's, it's a nice... Um, process um, to understand. So HLA, DQ2, and 8 are genetic testing, um, and I want to tell you how I did it wrong, and then you're going to learn how to do it right. Whenever we talk about tests in the past, and it's very common for us to think as physicians, if a test is positive, that's how we approach it, right? That was my mistake. You don't do it that way. This is one of those tests that has to be thought about in a negative way. So negative testing, not positive testing, negative testing. So if the patient uh, does not have HLA DQ2, DQ8, they are not patients who have the um, gene for uh, SPRU, nor will they ever get it in the future. So it's very important. So let's talk about, so everybody's clear with that? Because I want to make sure that you got the genetic part, testing correct. And this is going to be costing, depending upon uh, the location in your country, several hundred dollars. So be aware of that. And then I'm going to talk a little bit later about um, you know, trying to figure out some of these people who are actually SPRU, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, when to do the testing, when not. But we're going to get to that in a, uh, in a little bit. So the gluten challenge, which we talked about briefly before, is part of um, uh, just seeing whether they even want to do it. Very, in my practice, over the years, very, very few people would be willing to do it because, again, they had their mindset about, um, about uh, where they were. They didn't want to have that uh, challenge done. And two, three grams of gluten is two slices of bread. You have to do it for two weeks, and the reason that you have to do it for two weeks is that you have to develop the uh, reaction again. You're absolutely correct. You have to develop that reaction again. So um, it takes that period of time. You can't do it shorter than that, longer than that. It's even better. And choice number three is staying on the diet. Staying on the diet. You're 50% better. 50% is better than, um, than nothing. So that's among the choices that this kind of patient <laughs> would have. So who can answer this? This is one of these interactive, and I got lots more stuff here, and I'm not bringing it back to Connecticut for sure. So um, who can answer this? Because we heard about it before. What's, what's the answer? Is that you? There you go. All right, so increased sugar, increased fat. So if you are on that diet, um, just to be aware that that can be the potential for a problem. Sam is a 34-year-old patient who visited his primary care doctor for a routine visit. Routine bloods, here we see H&H, &H, 11 and 33, iron 14, endocolon normal, urinalysis normal. Now what? So there's another interactive question, and I need to have some interactivity. So tell me, what do you want to do? I heard something, some whisper on that side of the room. Go ahead. What's his chief complaint? Um, he was seeing his doctor for a routine visit. OK, so, but you still get rewarded. I, I need you to be able to do this with me. So tell me, what's the next step? Has he had a hemocult? Has he had a He had a hemocult, which was negative. Thank you. OK. This is how we get interactivity. Go ahead. 
So check HTTG. OK, we will get to that. But what before? Because again, with this kind of thing, do you feel comfortable? Obviously, we're in, a, we're in a celiac lecture, non-celiac gluten sensitivity. But I don't want to silo this um, into just uh, celiac. We're, we're going to get to that, and I'll give you the answer to that. But you see a young person um, like that, what are you going to do? What's that? Well, there are several answers. Look for uh, deficiency. So what, what specific? Malabsor malabsorptions kind of things. So um, you lit up the room with that. And there are a whole bunch of other people here. You lit up the room. Go ahead. OK, so we heard some other things. I'm going to get to this side of the room. You're awfully quiet. I want to make sure you're not sleeping. OK, so diet. Maybe, maybe he's a vegetarian. I like that. Um, I, can, I can reach you with this. You're going to get another one. Share it, share it with your friends. Um, OK, what else? There's more stuff. Wow, I love that. How many times has he donated blood? You get the teddy bear. Um, I've seen that a million times. You know, they come to the, I won't say a million times, dozens of times, coming to the GI office. Nobody in the primary care office asked, you know, asked that question. And you know, they, they, they just donated blood. What a waste of time. That's exactly right. OK, what else? Go ahead. OK, um, you're still going to get rewarded. It's not my primary thing that I would look for. In fact, there was an article this week that just says vitamin D deficiency across the United States is unbelievable. You know, cardiac disease and GI disease and all of this stuff. So do we have a pandemic of vitamin D deficiency? So I'm going to reemphasize that. Um, read this to everybody out loud. Nice and loud. Never stop learning. Never stop learning. What else are we going to do for this patient? Even with a negative gene fault, maybe you should do a capsule study? Or something, something in the small bowel. You know, we should certainly check. Um, you know, either you're going to do um, a small bowel study, uh, a capsule study, uh, MR enterography, or something along those lines. And that's great. Um, that's, that's kind of, and again, this is the whole point of doing this. And I'm coming to this side. So get ready on this side of the room. I'm not going to disappear from this side of the room, because this side of the room is doing too much uh, of the answering. So the, the, the bottom line there is exactly right. We can't ignore that uh, small bowel, even with a hemocult that's negative, because the, pa the patient can have intermittent, an intermittent process that's going on. But the whole point of a case like this and in a lecture like this, we can't silo this information. The patients don't come to you with celiac disease written on their forehead. They come to you with stuff like this. So um, doing this, doing this workup um, uh, was appropriate. And uh, the answer for, for this particular patient was, um, you were right, that it was, um, and you get the, that was you, correct? And you get the brain. Um, it was um, TTG uh, positive. But the message here is that people can present with anemia just like this as a manifestation of celiac disease. They don't have to have a lot of GI symptomatology. Most of them do, but not everybody does. Can anybody think, I'm coming to this side of the room now, because I need to hear some answers here, and I need to get rid of some of this stuff. Um, it's less to carry home. Um, so what part is missing? We have the endo and the colon here. Is there a part that's missing in this workup that you can think of that might be important? Uh, the bone marrow? What's that? Bone marrow? Uh, bone marrow? Maybe, maybe you do that as part of the workup, but you're on the left side of the room, so you don't count. I'm <laughs> sorry. Uh, this side of the room. Well, what, what was missing from this? What was missing from this? Yes, in the workup. What was missing? Um, ferrit fer well, we have iron, and assume, assume that the ferritin is low and iron binding capacity is high. But I just, I just heard it here, biopsies, correct? That was you. So biopsies. Um, the biopsy is so extremely important under these circumstances. When we have these people who have anemia, uh, part of the thing that we think about as gastroenterologists is that we're looking for lesions, ulcers, cancers, inflammatory bowel disease, 
uh, AV malformations. The list is endless. Um, but we can't, we can't stop there because, again, if we have a patient with anemia and we're down there, we do small bowel biopsies just to make sure. I mean, that's kind of backwards, but it adds, it adds probably $25 to $50 uh, to the cost of that endoscopy and colonoscopy anyway, minimal cost. But we check for sprue that way anyway, and we're down there. You got to do the biopsies. So um, that's, that's the take home message with this kind of thing. So you're getting there uh, right side of the room, and we're going to continue to ask you some more things. So here's some extra credit questions. Very important because it's based on um, years of patients, and I need to hear from this side of the room. Can the filler in pills, capsules, exacerbate sprue? Yes. yes. And you get a reward for that. Um, and um, how often does that happen? You get a patient coming in, I'm going to tell you. And her name is Joan. And she's going to come in and tell you the following story. Uh, it's going to be very, very, kind of, very common. My gastroenterologist is not available. He's doing 16 procedures today. He said he's going to get back to me um, you know, in a couple of days. But I need to know from you, doctor, um, what's going on. I called the drug manufacturer. There are five micrograms of um, gluten in my capsule. And I'm taking these um, uh, cardiac or uh, antipsychotic medicines. Should I stop them right away? <laughs> You're going to hear that stuff. These people just get so specific with their uh, things. Um, and you have to be prepared for that kind of thing. Because again, you have to weigh the pros and the cons. And there'll be people who will stop medicine after medicine after medicine. <clears throat> because they think it's just exacerbating uh, their situation. Um, and um, it doesn't necessarily do that. It's, there's other stuff going on, and we're going to get to that in a moment. And that leads to the question of two. Can irritable bowel and sprue coexist? Yes. And the answer is absolutely. And of course, irritable bowel and non-celiac gluten sensitivity can coexist as well. This is the answer. So they can have both together. And you have to look at that carefully. And we're going to talk in, the, in a few moments about how to differentiate the two. But the key here is they can coexist. And if they're following their sprue diet carefully, you need to treat them for irritable bowel. And we're going to spend lots of time later on talking about irritable bowel. So before we get to um, the next question, I need a definition, again, from this side of the room. You've got to do a little bit of uh, more work here to uh, satisfy our requirements. Um, tell me what microscopic colitis is. It is what it sounds. Every, everybody except you. I know you know what it is. So what's microscopic colitis? Uh, you mean I have to go to the helpline on the other side of the room? <laughs> okay, try. You can see it in people that have chronic diarrhea. Yes. 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 And frequently the biopsy comes back microscopic Okay. But beyond that, I can't. I don't know. Yo, you're, you're good. May all your patients listen magically to what you have to tell them. Okay, then make sure that that's an obey wand. Okay, so this side of the room, help fill in the rest of this. It appears normal. It appears normal. Thank you very much. It appears normal. The uh, appearance is normal. I'm keeping an eye on you. Um, it appears normal grossly, right. So it appears normal. So um, I'm going to ask another question on top of that, and then we're going to get back to here. Can microscopic colitis ever evolve into ulcerative colitis? Take a guess. You're going to be 50% right. No. Somebody take a guess. No. No. The, the no's have it. Okay. So um, that's perfect. So here you go. Um, that's exactly right. So it does, not, it does not evolve. It's a separate disease. But I want to tell you a little bit about this. Um, and um, it's kind of the theme of the GI theme of this morning. Um, and I'm going to tell you about a patient who I had seen um, several years ago. And it'll kind of uh, uh, bring this to the fore. 
older patient, 75 years old, uh, came to the emergency room, several month history of diarrhea, weight loss, um, profoundly hypotensive. She had about 25 pound weight loss, profoundly hypotensive. Electrolytes were out of whack. Um, her, she was uh, dehydrated. Creatinine was actually uh, elevated uh, as well. And what is, what's the first thing that we think about when we have that kind of patient? It is? It is? Cancer. It's cancer. Uh, I didn't say that she had fever. Um, but uh, the first thing we think about is cancer. It turns out when we did the colonoscopy, the colonoscope easily went in, took a look around. Uh, no masses to be seen. But I did do the biopsies, so looking for microscopic colitis. Both of you got that right. Looking for microscopic colitis. And there it was. She had this microscopic colitis. And we treated her. I'm not going to get into the medications. That's a specific um, separate topic. We uh, treated her with the uh, medications. She did fine. Sent her out. Stopped her medic medications about six months later. Came into the hospital. This time, hypotensive. Had a mitocardial infarction. Continued the medicines ever since then, luckily. But again, that's the kind of patient that we're talking about. Elderly person. Nothing to be seen uh, colonoscopically, see, see it on biopsy, and um, basically with medications, they, they can do a lot better. So the question here is, can sprue and microscopic colitis coexist? Sure. Absolutely. That's part of that process as well. And that creates one of these um, additional dilemmas. That's when you sometimes need to get a hold of that gastroenterologist because they may need to, um, to do that colonoscopy uh, for you. So part of the way of evaluating this further is um, number one is to make sure that they're following their diet. Anybody have any good solutions as to how to make sure that they're following their diet? <laughs> you know the answer. I know you know the answer. Is um, if it is a husband, you bring in the wife. <laughs> you, know, you know how that works, right? Um, if it's a wife, maybe the husband will show up, maybe not, but um, it, it, the other way around, it, it always works. Um, so they, it, can, it can certainly coexist. And again, if they're following their diet and they're still having troubles, that's when we need to look for um, microscopic colitis. Here's another great one. And again, it came from my nurse practitioner friends. Can the microbiome be associated with sprue? I'm not going to ask you that. I'm going to answer that for you. And the answer is absolutely. Will transforming the microbiome in the future make a difference? Perhaps. Um, so we got to look at that. There you go. Um, can, um, can changing the microbiome in the future be associated with um, uh, improving sprue? Perhaps. We're not quite there yet. How do we treat sprue in 2016? Let's go for it. As long as the sign is not chain stoking, we're OK. OK, so most of you got that right. And this, there's always teaching to my slides, um, a lot of important points here. Diet in the year 2016 is exactly right. But there's more to it than that. And that's why I put this slide up. Currently, several companies are working on peptide vaccinations, an injection, um, and uh, other companies are working on enzymes. Anybody out here using Bino? <clears throat> Bino. OK, so you know what we're talking about when people have gas. Um, any sort of products for uh, milk uh, absorption milk for people who have lactose intolerance. How many of you are using that? Right. How many Americans are cheating on their diet at this moment? Give me a percentage. <laughs> Just about everybody, right? There's a market for this. That's one of the dilemmas, that, and we're going to talk about that actually tomorrow when we're talking about uh, fatty liver. <coughs> just about everybody's cheating on their diet. It's just a question of how much. So there is a tremendous market for this. And uh, that's why these companies are um, looking into um, these possibilities. So Edie is a. Um, 
47-year-old, female, long-standing history of bloating, constipation, and diarrhea, full workup. Here's the workup. You can see it in front of you. All negative. CBC, T4, TTG, IgA. She returns and asks, what else can she do? Let me go back here. So I need some help. What's that? Review medication list. That's excellent. Food diary. Food diary, yeah. Absolutely. What else? Okay, that's eventually, um, once, we, once we come to it, an answer, um, I'm talking about how to, how to evaluate her because we're, we're um, uh, talking about how to evaluate her first before we go to um, uh, therapeutics. Um, any, any other things that we need to do? Stress, you know, stress, yes? When you say she's, uh, her workup's negative, has she had blind biopsies of her small bowel? Has she had small, small bowel biopsies under these circumstances? Uh, yes, on this, on this circumstance, yes. Right, just like, just like we said before, perfect. Um, she has a absolutely had the small bowel biopsies. What's that? A challenge, but again, we know that her uh, TTG IgA is negative, okay? How would uh, a gluten challenge help? What's that? Do testing again. So that's a wonderful question. You get rewarded for asking that um, because again, um, here's, your, here's your reward. So what is the specificity? So I had this just on Wednesday when I taught the uh, medical students. What is the specificity um, of a TTG IgA? How high? 98%. It's very, very, very high. So it's not like these borderline tests. We have lots of other tests who don't have that high sensitivity and specificity. It is extremely high, so we don't really have to necessarily worry about a uh, retesting under these uh, circumstances. Um, and uh, so basically when we have this, when we have this kind of patient um, and uh, we have the TTG IgA uh, that's negative, endocolon negative, what do we think about? What disease entity are we thinking about for ED? IBS. IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. And again, we talked about probiotics, so uh, excellent. And um, you get I don't know if I've given you the special one, but here you go. Um, so exactly right, so uh, probiotics, and we're gonna talk a whole bunch more about this later. We don't have to go into the details of all of that. So, um, and we were talking about uh, what we're considering and the treatment recommendations. Um, anybody has used FODMAP diet? It's kind of a prelude to what we're gonna be talking about before. Have your patients been happy with the FODMAP diet? Yes. What's that? Yes. yes. How long have they been on it? Six months, excellent. Some people, some people do very well. Um, is it an easy diet or a hard diet? It's extremely hard. Uh, and we're gonna talk about that. So this is previews of things. We've got a movie, movie house downstairs, so I got in the mood of previews uh, in about an hour and so. Uh, we're gonna be talking about the, um, this, this diet. So you'll learn a whole bunch more about the FODMAP diet, when it can be used. Just think about it this way. I'm gonna give you the little nugget. It's my nuclear option. Has it been your nuclear option as well? When, when rest. So uh, when we have very, very, very difficult patients, it's our nuclear option. And why I mentioned that right after Edie, because it may be the solu among the solutions of things that we use for her. Extra, extra credit, do all patients who are TTG positive need a small bowel biopsy? We answered that before. In unison? No, because? Very specific. Right, because it's highly specific and sensitive in the appropriate population. You don't just do this willy-nilly across the board, everybody in Times Square, you're gonna get false positives and false negatives galore, but people who have the symptoms, it'll be fine. Under what circumstances should we use TTG to follow a sprue patient? I learned this again from my nurse practitioner friends. What's that? To measure compliance, that's exactly right. That's exactly what they told me that they're doing. Um, because again, if you don't have that wife coming in, um, you can double check it this way to make sure that they're, they're being compliant. Um, 
do patients with a diagnosis of sprue who are doing well on a glute, on gluten uh, free diet need a rechallenge? No. no. Do they need rebiopsy? No. Here's a really important one that I wanted to share with all of you. Because again, the GI societies are different than us in, um, you know, in the field. So um, under what circumstances would you recommend um, uh, testing to asymptomatic family members? Right side of the room, tell me. <coughs> Left side of the room. None. None. OK. So the, um, here's, here's the thing. If you have a positive test in a patient, uh, and that's what I want to reemphasize. I personally would not recommend it because if you have a positive test and the patient is asymptomatic, every year around this time when that patient has diarrhea, they're going to be calling your office. Maybe they're going to be calling your office twice a year. Do I have, do I have sprue yet? And you're going to have to deal with that kind of thing. I think a much better approach is to make sure that you tell them, well, you may develop it. There's a, there is a, uh, it, there is a fam familial incidence, about 15% in the family. Um, but um, if you develop consistent diarrhea, come in and we'll talk about it and we'll do the testing. So I'm in full agreement with that. The societies are all different, especially the pediatric societies. Say, so test them all. Um, and um, I totally disagree with that. Are there false positive TTT results? There always are. I'm going to tell you what, what they are. Well, actually, one, what one important one is. It is um, Crohn's disease. It's not a marker for, don't anybody write this down, it's not a marker for Crohn's disease, but you can get a false positive with Crohn's disease. But again, remember, it's such a specific test. Um, that's, that's really for gastroenterologists. Um, can celiac disease occur in the presence of constipation? There's 50% chance of getting it right. Go ahead. Yes. You all got it right. Um, what should we do for a patient referred to your office with TTG negative, biopsy negative, genetics positive? I'm going to help you with that. That's a, that's a tough one. The genetics, remember what I said before. It's the genetics are the negative marker. Remember what I said? Remember my mistake? It's the negative marker, not the positive marker. The positive marker is present in 40% of the American population. So this reemphasizes what I said before. You have to look for the negative, not the positive under these circumstances. So this patient, welcome to the American population of 40%, because this doesn't mean anything as long as there's been um, um, the adequate workup, which there has been. Dr. Abel had a patient with an anticholate antibody IgG positive from 1997. And again, I want to reemphasize, we don't even use this. It's a deaminated anti-gliadin antibody, so we don't even use this test anymore. 1997, patient is doing very well on a gluten-free diet. Any advice? Continue. Congratulations. Leave well enough alone. Let sleeping dogs lie. I agree with that completely. Ron G is a 45-year-old patient with diarrhea and cramps. TTG positive, negative small bowel biopsy sent back to you by the GI doc. What can you do? I'm going to answer this for you because this is kind of a leading question. The standard of care in the year 2016 is six biopsies, not four. We used to do four. I used to do four. It's six biopsies, four in the second part of the duodenum and two in the duodenal bulb. And the reason behind that is that you can find very early sprue if you do those biopsies in the duodenal bulb, and you may not see it in the second part of the du duodenum. So when you get back to your communities on Monday and you have this kind of patient, you may want to have a casual conversation with your gastroenterologist because you don't want to have patients dump back to you who actually may have sprue. Make sure that they're doing the six biopsies, which is the standard of care. Is there a relationship between celiac disease and lymphoma? Yes. 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 The number is about 1 in 8,000. The uh, figures years ago, before we had sophisticated testing and before we had endoscopy, it was mixed together. So uh, the numbers were, were much, much, much higher. But there is a relationship. And that's another consideration of a patient that needs to see a gastroenterologist. They're absolutely following their diet. 
they're starting to have troubles once again, weight loss, diarrhea, et cetera, that's the time to get back to a gastroenterologist and they may have to do additional testing. How do we distinguish true celiac disease from patients with irritable bowel syndrome? Basically getting that diet history, getting it as clearly as we can, um, and again, having another family member there to substantiate it or friend, something along those lines, because sometimes it becomes uh, almost impossible. Harry, the last of our uh, presentations here, 54-year-old uh, patient with type 1 diabetes. Here's the medicines that he's on, sugars, as you can see. Patient has abdominal pain, bloating, and occasional diarrhea. How should we work up the problem? What do we think about in Harry when he's having bloating, occasional uh, diarrhea? What's the GI consequence um, in the in test, uh, the diabetic consequence in the GI tract? Yeah, it's it, <clears throat> yeah it, so it can be a neuropathic bowel. It can be a, a small bowel overgrowth. What's the stuff that happens with the stomach? What's that called? Gastroparesis. But the reason that I'm presenting this to you, and I like to think about gastroparesis, there is a strong association between type 1 diabetes and SPRU. There's an association. So that's the kind of thing that you'll have to work out and work up with your gastroenterologist if they have these kinds of things. So it's more than one thing to think about, and I've given you another uh, aspect of it to, uh, to think about to make sure that, indeed, if they're going to be even going down there to do the endoscopy, um, that they can do the, um, the small bowel biopsy as well. And uh, we talked about that. Um, and let's move on to, um, ah, uh, the last one. Are the uh, HLA DQ2 and 8 genes associated with any other illnesses? You were shaking your head? Not particularly the spondylic arthrosis, but they're two big ones. Diabetes and autoimmune disease. Diabetes and autoimmune disease are linked with HLA-DQ2 and 8. And if serology and biopsy are equivocal, can genetic testing make a definitive diagnosis? In unison? No. If serology and biopsy are equivalent, can genetic testing make a definitive negative, negative. diagnosis? Yes, it can under the, these circumstances. TTG, um, we're talking about several hundred. HLA, um, uh, more, a lot more than that, small bowel biopsy, depending upon your region of the country. Um, it can range um, uh, uh, even more than that, um, and sometimes into the thousands. So wrapping this up, looking for the answers. Um, one of the foods for thought is, no pun intended, um, Genetically modified wheat, the source of increased SPRU and non-celiac gluten sensitivity? Maybe. Will we have markers for non-celiac gluten sensitivity in the future? Yes, we will have that. They're currently working on it right now. It is a true entity, but again, it's up to you to help distinguish who are true uh, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, similar to the patients that I talked about before. Uh, my, my, my friend, uh, as opposed to the irritable bowel uh, patients. And I want to thank you very much. You've been great. <laughs>